This is an interview with Harry Blizzard, founding member of the Board of Trustees of Elgin Community College, who is currently a resident of Elgin, Illinois. This interview is being conducted on Thursday, February 4th, 2016 at Elgin Community College. The interviewer is Polly Nash. Welcome. Thank you. Uh, to start out, can you tell us a little bit about your own background, uh, when and where you were born and raised, maybe some about your family and your education? Sure. Uh, I was born in a small town in northwestern Iowa. And uh, a lot of people think a small town is you know, five, ten thousand. This is a real small town. Its population was at its peak it was eleven hundred and fifty, uh, and it was a center of uh, business in the area. And it it was there because of the intersection of two railroads. The Milwaukee went from Des Moines to Okaboji, and the other was the uh, Illinois Central went from Chicago to Sioux City. So that was a big reason why people went there, because there was two railroads back before there were cars. And that's where the railroads intersected? Mm -hmm. Right at our town. And, uh, and what was the name of your town? Fonda. F-O-N-D-A. Okay. Yeah. And it was named after a city or a small town in Upper New York State. But anyway, my grandfather <clears throat> came there to start his store, and he, was, I, he had an option of several towns, but he was looking at Fonda because of the two railroads. And but he didn't like Spencer, Iowa, which was a town probably five to ten times bigger than Fonda, and he decided that he would pick the railroad town, and uh, that was probably a mistake. But, uh, and what was your grandfather's name? Harry A. Blizzard. Okay. And uh, then my father was Harold B. Blizzard, and I'm Harry B. Blizzard, and the B is from my grandmother's maiden name, Butler. Thank you. So, but anyway, uh, he, he, my grandfather was in the uh, clothing business in southeastern Iowa, and uh, he, but he wanted to go out on his own, and so he, they, he picked Fonda, moved there in 1895. My dad was born there in Fonda in 1896, and uh, well. Uh, they really did well, and the little community uh, did did grow, and, uh, and, and business was good, and, and the highways uh, were not there yet, but they were starting to build roads, and so it was all right. And uh, then uh, he he married my mother, who was a school teacher, and. Uh, and he met her from Fonda, and uh, we, I, I have one, had one sister, so it was a, she was uh, two years older than I. And when were you born? 1927, and uh, so we grew up in Fonda and everything, and of course we were growing up, an interesting thing is we were growing up during the Depression, but uh, we didn't know there was a depression, we as children, except for two things happened during that time. One, we always wondered why we couldn't go on a little vacation. And Dad said, no, we just don't have the money to do that. Well, one day my mother got a letter from Wyoming in the mail, opened it up, it was a check for $50 that was an inheritance from a some relative of hers she didn't even know. My folks took that $50 and we took Grandpa's old 28 Chevy and we headed north to northern Minnesota and southern Canada. And on that $50, we were able to do a whole two week trip. Two weeks? Yeah. Oh my goodness. Bought the gas, stayed in 
little homes and because uh, they didn't have anything back then. But, but but anyway, that was one reason why I knew there was an, a depression. The other was my closest friends. Uh, he his father was a plumber, and there was just no work for plumbers, especially in building new houses or anything. And he really was suffering. So I was over to his house one day, and the lights went out. And Merck, he says, uh, oh wait a minute, I gotta get a quarter and put it out in the electric meter. And I thought, wow. See, they, he, his father could not pay the electric bill. So they said in those days, those that can't will put a, a quarter meter in. You put a quarter and you get 25 cents worth of electricity. And do you remember how long that would last? That lasts quite a while back in those days, but uh, still had to do. So I, that, that, was, that was the first one. Then a few days later, he says, uh, oh, let's go for a walk. Grab one of those pails over there and let's go for a walk. Where are we going? Out on the railroad. Okay. We spent a lot of time going up and down the railroads and so on. And he went to where there was a curve. And uh, what he was doing was uh, hoping that a, a full coal train would have gone by and on the curve, on the fast, someone would fall off. And sure enough, we got there and there was enough coal that we picked up and, and took that back uh, to his house and that's how they kept warm. And th those were the only two things that I could remember, that, and of course the 30s were terrible for a lot of people. So now, that, did that your dad uh, have the clothing store too that your grandfather had? Yes, my dad, he, he, he went, uh, graduated from high school in 15 and went to Iowa State for one year. Then he transferred to Drake and then he came home and he got drafted into the First World War. And then when we came home, he met mother and we got married. So, uh, and then he worked all his life with his father in the clothing store. And uh, I worked there for a while after I graduated from high school. Well, I'll tell you about that a little bit. Uh, I, they put me in school too early and I was only 16 when I graduated from high school. And even though I turned 17 shortly, I decided that I didn't want to go to college because I didn't know what I wanted to do. Mm -hmm. And they said they wanted me to go to the little town of Storm Lake where Buena Vista College is, still there, nice little school. And I said, I don't want to go. And so Dad says, well, you have to get a job. You just can't do it. I'll get a job. So I got a job at a gas station and I worked at the gas station for a long time. And then, it was about a year, a little less, and I went to, or Dad came over and there came to me that, that morning and says, I want you to quit your job. I said, why? I want you to come work at the store. I said, well, why? You don't need any help. And he says, yes, I do. Uh, his longtime friend who he used to, double date with when mother and he were going together. He was a real close friend. And uh, he was having trouble with drinking and he was, really became an alcoholic. Mm -hmm. And dad says, he, I just can't have that in my store. So that was very difficult to tell his very best friend he had to fire him. And so I, I worked there until, uh, until I became 18. And uh, when I became 18, after, well, I'll back up just a little. I, during, when I was in high school, I took an exam, which was an army uh, exam. They had what they call the AR, Army Reserve Training Program, where they would take young people, and this is during the war, in the 40, or 44, 40, yeah. And, I would go to college and, and, and start out, and they all wanted us to take engineering. <laughs> and so I, I said, boy, that's my group, and I passed, and so, so I went to take my physical, 
Well, I went to take my physical three times, and I never passed because my eyes were bad. And uh, an interesting little story there. And the second time I took a physical up there, they had a break at just uh, at the mid midpoint of the exam, and for lunch. And I came back from lunch early. I went over there and I memorized this eye chart. <laughs> I memorized the eye chart. <laughs> and so I whipped right through that one, and the, the guy that did it, it was, he went over and talked to one of the doctors over there. And uh, the doctor says, tell that boy to come over. <laughs> and he says, how are you doing? I says, well, okay. Okay, I, I want you to uh, read that one over here. I couldn't even hardly see it. He says, I thought so. You bright little tricks on us, aren't you? Well, I wanted to get in, and it seemed like uh, uh, me having uh, glasses wasn't that difficult. Well, I tell you that story because then I, uh, I went home and, as I told you, worked uh, with my dad. Then at 18, back then, I became draft eligible, and I immediately got drafted. And so I had to go up for, for a physical. I thought, well, they'll never take me. Bingo, you're, you're fine. And I was in, and that was, that was it in a hurry. So, uh, well, anyway, that, that took care of, of me, and that's how I got into the Army. Okay. And then, Before we go yeah. into the Army, because I'd like to hear about your experiences there, if you wanted to reflect a little bit about Fonda and how it has changed? Sure. Uh, Fonda was a, a center of, because of the of the railroads and and all that, a center of all needs for the farmers. They would come from at least 10 miles in each direction. And uh, I, I have a list here of, <laughs> of things, and I want to tell you about why Fonda is not what it used to be. It, it Back in 1950, I think it reached its uh, Zenith. It really was a busy place. And I have a list here of what was in our little town. We had two railroads, six passenger trains per day. There were two schools, K through 12, two. And we had three doctors, two dentists, two veterinarians, two lawyers, six uh, uh, grocery stores, three hardware stores, five restaurants, one movie theater, three auto dealers, Chevy, Ford, and Chrysler, two farm implement companies, a newspaper, four churches, two pharmacies, two meat lockers, which is a big thing out there, you could freeze your meat and keep it, two barbers, two men's clothing stores, one of which was my father's, a uh, public swimming pool, a golf course, a blacksmith, four gas stations, two grain elevators, a dry cleaner, a bank, post office, state liquor store, and four taverns, and two women's stores. Same number of taverns as churches. Yeah, uh, uh, I think that grew <laughs> a little more the other way. But that's 72 different organizations so, I mean, the town was bustling. We had everything. Now, go, go back to present, 2016. I haven't been there lately, but uh, I have heard that, number one, that they, the school, that when I went to it as kindergarten, I was only eight years old. The school was very, very nice. The school's gone. They tore it down. There is no school in Fonda. None of all, none of all. They have to go to another town. And uh, so what, what's left? Well, there's only one railroad, one, they tore up the tracks. And there's only one train that comes through and it's a freight train. So all that good stuff with it, but left is a grocery store, two taverns they hung in, and uh, one restaurant, two churches, we lost two churches. Uh, the pool and the golf, or uh, pool, swimming pool and the golf, uh, great places uh, still there. One grain elevator, 
a bank and a post office. Now you see that went from 72 down to 12. Well, well back in 1950 the land was worth about 500 an acre. Now the land is worth from 5,000 to 8,000 an acre. Well, you know, you think, well, that, that's, that's good. But no, it's not good because the, the thing is, back in 1950, it took two men to farm uh, 160 acres, which is a quarter section. And uh, now, two men with the equipment they have can farm between 640 and 1,000 acres. Well, you're less than one-fifth the number of people that are farming around. And there was, and it was strictly, a, the town was for the farmers. And what's left, it's down to a population of about 400, and they're all retired farmers. So, now, that is, that is real, real bad. They tried, oh, sometime after the war, to get manufacturing to come. They didn't try hard enough. If they would have, maybe that would have helped. But just the farming, it's so successful, and the, if you, if you have some of that land, uh, it's, it's a good way to make a living, but it doesn't take many of them to do it. So that's, uh, that, that's a problem that's not unique to Fonda. That's, that's the same all through the Midwest. Here in Illinois, in Minnesota, and Wisconsin, it's all the same. So anyway, Good. there Thank you go. You. So we were talking about um, your military career and um, how at first you passed the written but failed the eye exam, and then yeah. when you were drafted you passed everything with flying yeah. colors. <laughs> so you were in the military, is that, uh, and you talked about engineering, can you talk about the relationship between sure. your military career and your interest in engineering? Well, I think more was I, I matured considerably in the year and a half I was in the military. And I, and I did know that I wanted to, to, to be an outside person and I wanted to do uh, civil engineering. So I, I did know that. And a lot of that came from my high school math teacher who... Uh, who was also the coach uh, of the all athletics and principal of the high school and everything. I, I was very impressed with him and uh, he was a civil engineer and so uh, I think I, I, yes, I decided then that that was good. It was sort of an interesting story when I went into, in the first day I was there they gave me fatigues and, and I got called and he said, you go over there, and what am I going to do? You're going to peel potatoes. Well, that's, that's what every, you see that as that, <laughs> that's a classic of what you, you do when you get into the army. But the peeling potatoes then, they had a machine that actually peeled them, but then they, they wouldn't, in the eyes, they, they had to have this, so you take the potato and peel it up. Well, anyway, I did that one day, and I did it for a second day, all of a sudden, a sergeant came in and said, is there a guy named Blizzard here? Yeah, I said, good, the captain wants to see you. <laughs> I don't know, why would the captain want to see me? And I, 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 so I went in there and I didn't know how to salute. <laughs> and I gave it the old try and, and uh, he says, well, sit down, son. And I, I said, how would you like to stay here at Fort Snelling in Minnesota and, and work here for us? I said, well, I'm on a 25-person roster and I'm getting to be friendly with all of them. I'd probably prefer to go with them. Well, you're not going. You're staying here. And I says, oh, what do you got in mind? And he says, well, we're going to have you work in the clothing warehouse. He saw that the... My, my dad had a clothing store, but that was only part of it. He also had the, uh, the exams that we take, and it's just like an IQ, and it's almost on the same basis. 55 is almost, per 155 is perfect, 
below 100 is not good. And so they picked everybody who was 125 or up. In fact, we had one or two who were 150, and they're geniuses. But anyway, that, that's, that's how I happened to stay in Fort Snelling. And I, it, it turned out that was, that was the best thing it could have had. I, I learned things, and I made corporal there in the year and a half, and, and it was just loads of fun. And uh, I also had my first experience at ever even seeing anything about a, uh, or hearing of a symphony orchestra, which I can tell you about a little bit later. But uh, that's, that's my Army career. So how did that tie into engineering? In your well, interest in engineering? It, it didn't directly, but, it, but I just, I think it was more I matured, and I just had a feeling this is what I wanted to do. I was good at math and stuff, so that was where I should have been. So after um, the military, did you go on to collegiate work? Well, yes. I, I got out on, just before Christmas, and I wanted to start uh, at Iowa State uh, in the fall. And that uh, was what year? Uh, 19, uh, be 47. 47, yeah, okay, 1947. Thank you. And then, I, then a little problem came up. Well, I, I, I got a job with a construction company, and I went out to central Washington, where we were, they were building a large dam for irrigation purposes. And uh, I, I learned the, to, to survey with, uh, there. It was very helpful for me. And then I really knew I was really going to go there. So I applied for Iowa State. And uh, I got a note that says, you can't come in as a freshman because you do not have the qualifications you need. And I said, well, what do I do? Well, you have to take this uh, math course that you didn't have, and uh, then you can go. That'll take a, a year. And I said, no, 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 I can't do that. He says, well, we have a, a, a way you can uh, take care of that. The University of Nebraska has the finest uh, What do I call it? The, the, the finest when you t when you take by yourself. Oh, independent study. That's the word I was trying to come up with, and uh, so I quickly signed up for that, and uh, and they said, well, you got to have a professional teacher supervise you, and it happened to my landlady out in Washington. She was a teacher and so she said sure she'd do it and so I started but we were working 60 hours a week and I and this course I had to get done in six weeks and it was a six month course for most people and I decided then this is not going to work so I told my boss I had to quit to go home and get ready to go to college and get this done so I, I had a friend drive me to Spokane get on an airplane which I'd never been on before and flew to Minneapolis, my parents came and got me, and I spent the rest, another four or five weeks, every day studying, and I had a, a minister's uh, wife was also qualified for doing it. So I sent it all in, and uh, I was waiting and waiting, and I called them, How, how's it going, well, we're processing it. And I said, well, I got to get this pretty soon. And it got within two weeks of when it was re we were ready to start uh, freshman classes. And I finally, they finally said, yes, we received it, you're okay. Well, then I had to go down and find a place to stay, which you couldn't then because all the GIs were going to college. There was no place to stay. So I finally found a, a place where there were five others uh, down in the basement, <laughs> just packed in it. So, so I did get it to stay, and then I got in all right. So. That was, that was a nip and tucker, and I was so glad. And that started my college career. Right. And so after Iowa State, uh, or what did you major in it? At? Well, civil engineering, and uh, I was able to stick to their schedule, and, and they gave a couple credits to GIs, so that kept the things going a little easier. Uh, so it was all great. I got three years of GI Bill that paid for everything. 
So the fourth year I had to pay for myself, so I had to prepare for that. So I applied for a scholarship and got it, and it was for $300 back then in 1948 or nine. That was a lot of money, and it was very much appreciated. And uh, so I got through it all right, and uh, I worked all the time. I worked in a clothing store, Joe's Men's Shop, and uh, then I also delivered um, newspapers. The university, well, then it was a college. The college had a daily paper, a, five days a week, and I deliver it. And I went in mostly into the area where the fraternities and sororities were, and I'd leave 25 at a time, and, and I made a lot of money there. So I, I left I left college, and I had 600 bucks cash. So no student debt. No. That, that no debt at all, and but now I I've been walking all the time. I never had a car in my life, so I said I got to get a car. So uh, Dad says, well, he give me six hundred, my six hundred, and put it together, and and we went to the bank, and they gave me six hundred local bank. One of them that I just told you is still there, and. So I had 1800 bucks, and I was able to buy a brand new Chevy Coupe for, for $1,800, but I couldn't find one. <laughs> Korean War was on, 1951, the Korean War was on. It, it was just very difficult to get a car. So I had a professor who said, I can help you out. He lived in Boone, Iowa, and right next to Ames. And he says, that Chevy dealer owes me. I'll go over and tell him he's got to get you one. Boy, just in a few days, I had this beautiful little car, and uh, I was off and running. Well, I had to get a job now, right? And uh, they they were interviewing, and I would interview some, and I said, no, I don't think I, I'm interested. And <laughs> finally, I, this one came, and uh, it, was, it was outdoor, and I, I liked the very, uh, I liked the person. The, the, the head of the company came out to interview, who was also a graduate of Iowa State in civil engineering. So uh, it, it was a company called Muncie Construction Company from Muncie, Indiana. And off I went with my new little car to, <laughs> to Muncie and uh, started right there. And they, they built electrical substations and high voltage power lines. And I worked four years there and was doing all right. But, uh, but what I probably would say the best thing that happened is that's where I met my wife, Phyllis. She was considerably younger than me, so I, had to, I just met her then and didn't see her again for three or four or five years. And, uh, well, anyway, that's another story. That's another story. But uh, it, was, it was great. But then came a realization that electrical wasn't my key. I wanted to just do civil work. So I uh, decided I'd quit. And I went up, the Northern, Northern Indiana was just building their toll road across the northern part of the state, which is I-80. Mm -hmm. And so I went up there and I found the guy that was doing just what I thought I would like to do. So I took the job, and when I told my best friend that, 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 that we worked with, I said, well, I'm leaving, and I'm going up there and take this job, and they, 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 they said, <laughs> they're going to hold me down and say, you can't give this job up to go working on something that you don't even know will last six months. I said, well, I, I, I'm not married. I, I can do this. And so I did. I bought a brand new trailer, and so I'd have something that I knew I would be traveling, and I didn't want to go into different people's houses all the time. So I had my own, which was real nice, and off I went. But they said, you're nuts. I had, with Muncie Construction, I was finally in charge of substation uh, bidding and, and supervision, and I had a car and everything, and I had nothing, no, no guarantees of anything even guarantees of, of work for a full year. But it was the right thing to do, and if I had 
been a married person, I couldn't have done it. But I could take the risk because I was all by myself. Mm -hmm. And it worked out. And uh, I worked for that guy for five years. So you were working in northern Indiana at yeah. that time? And then, now we're going to get out of there to, to Illinois. When we were just were finishing up, I worked about six or seven different projects in northern Illinois. He said, uh, well, Illinois is going to build something even more. They've got a system that's going to more be three times what the Indiana one was. So I want you to go over there and uh, start checking when the bidding is coming out and, and see who the successful contractors are and, and, uh, and get the business going over there, which I did. My first job was now to select where shall I go to live. So I look at the map to where the toll road was to go, and as you know, most that it goes from the Indiana border to the Wisconsin border. It goes from Oak Brook to Aurora, and it goes to from O'Hare to Rockford to Beloit. And I'm looking at the map, and I don't know much about it. Because you've Illinois. never lived in Not much. Illinois. Mm -hmm. And uh, I said, well, it looks like Elgin is, is a good location. It's, it's uh, out far enough. And, uh, so I picked it. And so I looked for a place to bring my trailer. And I found so you were still living in the trailer? Oh, yeah. yeah I was still single. And I was waiting for my wife to grow up. So. We were starting to date about then, I think. Well, she was uh, in nurse's training in Washington, D.C. at the time. But So I had to find a place to uh, park my, uh, my trailer. And I had to have a telephone. <laughs> that was key. <laughs> they weren't everywhere in some of these trailer parks. And so I found it. And it right on McLean Boulevard, and it's still there today. It's called Bushy Trailer Park. I lived there from fall of, of uh, 56 until I, until I was, we were married in, in uh, February of uh, 59. So I lived there all, a long time. And it was a great place for me to be. That fit the bill. Well, it was, it was just right now I had to get enough work. And I was lucky enough to get a lot of contracts with the contractors. So you worked for different contractors? Yes. Uh, that, yes. Well, yeah, that's, that's true. And. Uh, we worked all the way from Libertyville in the north to Alsop in the south and to uh, Naperville and that way on that leg. And we didn't work much west here, but we worked here at Elgin and a lot of it around O'Hare and an awful lot up north. And so we had, uh, we had an average of 20 people working. At the very peak, we had 40 people working for us. And uh, I was doing it all myself. My boss didn't come over very often. He uh, was busy, I don't know, busy. doing something. So what were some of your favorite projects? <clears throat> well, well, all of the toll road and all. But the toll road I thought would be done, you know, and we built it in two years, which is a miracle. And, uh, but I, well, I never stopped. Uh, for the next 30 years, I still continued working the OIs always had jobs. Mm -hmm. So it was a, that's a good job for me. And then then, then O'Hare Field came, and I started that in the fall of 58. And I was there, it was my last job on April 1st in 1990. So uh, uh, it just lasted forever. And those, those were very, now, but my very favorite job wasn't in construction, it was in uh, preliminary design surveys where we would go out and we would locate 
a road and in, in almost in all cases that would be interstate highway and uh, we would then take topography and and all elevations and so that the engineers could uh, could design the road and but we located it and put control out there that they could recover and uh, so that was my favorite because you it was so quiet you could be out there and you're out in the cornfields or anything and no, no traffic we're, we're no because it's before we're, we're all, all these other places just traffic everywhere so this was this is why it was so much fun and in 1965 I got two, three jobs in southern Illinois, and they were going to take all the summer and more. And I, Phyllis and I had th three little girls by that time in 65. And so I moved us all down, and we, we lived down in Wyama, Illinois, and Metropolis, uh, way down there. And, the, and doing those design surveys we were a lot of fun, a lot of fun, because we were, we were our own bosses. When you were <laughs> working for contractors, they, they, they would call me and, and, uh, and say, I want you there, and, and when? Well, I need you right now. And uh, you don't have that, you, you can do what you want and schedule. And so, so that was my favorite, but my bread and butter was always you know, the construction jobs. If you don't mind, could we focus your attention on the Elgin area and we know why you decided to come here. Can you describe what Elgin was like when you came here? Didn't you say it was 1956? Yeah. Well, none of the uh, Civic Center was there then, of course. Um, Elgin was, <laughs> was then a uh, leading town for, for retail sales. They, were, they came from everywhere to buy, you know, we had four major department stores with Speeds and Ackermans and, and uh, Sears and Pennies and one called Block and Cool, which was a very classy thing. I mean, it was, a, it was a really a going town. Um, it, it, uh, well, it, it just was, a, a good place. They brought, they established this town back in I don't know, 1830s because it was a good location. It's still a good location. Today it's a, it's a, a fine location because it's it's got the railroad to go to town in, it's got the expressways to go whichever way you want. It's, it's just a, a great location. Uh, here I'm still a bachelor, and so I hadn't time to do much cooking, and so I'd have to find a place to eat in the evening, uh, usually after 5.30 or 6 or so. You know where the best place to eat in town was in those days? The basement of the YWCA. <laughs> Anybody who's my age will tell you that was the place to eat. The women there were just amazing and the pies they made were out of this world. But, but the, 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 they'd have roast beef one time and, and the roast pork the next and then chicken the next. And, Good home and, cooking. Oh my gosh, yes, it was just great. So that, that's, that's a, a memory of, of, of the old times. Um, Elgin has changed an awful lot, yeah. Right. So when you came here, when you moved here, the college was part of the school district, the Elgin School District. Yes. And um, and then at some point, um, the in 1965, the community college system in Illinois yes. was formed. Yes, that and is true. Did you know about the college before <laughs> that? Before the oh yes, I knew about it, but uh, I knew that it was you know a bunch of houses along Chicago Street. And one of them was called Renner Hall. And I, knew, I knew all that, but and I knew that it was something that was going to grow. And uh, 
then when, when this came about, uh, well, here, here's how it went. Uh, it was 1965, and uh, they, we had to have a board established for this area, which the district, and it was called 509 then, and uh, so we had to have a, have a new board of directors. And uh, the board of the U46 said, well, let's, let's be proactive, let's select seven people and run them as a, as a group. And they worked together and, and, and everything. And uh, they didn't have any trouble at all in getting the, the, the first six of those seven. And uh, a friend of mine who lives out near us, he was on the board at the time, and, and he says, well, I'll bet you Harry Blizzard would like to do this, and I think he'd be good. And so they, they asked me if I wanted to run for the board, and I said, yeah, I think I would. And uh, so they selected me, and uh, really it was a risk on their part because all the rest of them were very well known in the community. Nobody knew me. See, I had no business in Elgin. All my business was to the east of us and with contractors and engineering firms. But you ran as a slate. Yes, we did. And there were, there were, I think, there were 22 people running for the board. Oh yeah, I thought there was even more than that, but it was a good number. And it was, it was a, a real contest. But uh, we, we worked hard. Uh, uh, we wanted to be first on the list, the seven of us. And uh, to do that, you had to be first to sign up down in Geneva. So we went down there and started saying, standing in front of the door <laughs> two days before they opened it. Boy, we stayed day and night and uh, got clear close to the end. And I won't tell you who it was, but uh, a lady who was running for it, uh, we were ready to go in. She just walked up, pushed herself up and walked in first. Well, I'm happy to say she didn't get elected. <laughs> <laughs> but we were still together, and, uh, and we all worked. And, uh, I, but I, I didn't know people, so I, had, I did some, some menial tasks, maybe, and they were really hitting all the people they know. I have a picture yes. of the, the founding board, and I wondered yeah. if you might talk about well, each of those individuals. Well. Yes, I, I, I did not really know any of these people until I knew of them, but first of all, there's Bob Hoffer here. And Bob, of course, was a dynamo and a, really a, a number one philanthropist in the, in the city. And he just is. And he had a company. A Hoffer Plastics, which is a huge employer down in South Belgium. And then there was. John Eshelman, John, uh, John and I are the only ones that are still alive. Uh, he was a banker, worked for First National Bank and other th things. He was, he's a, a fine man. Next is Richard Gromer. Uh, Dick Gromer, uh, for those who have been around a long time, had a super supermarket, uh, grocery store Gromer's out in the West, and he had six others until things didn't go so good for him. And then uh, next was uh, Joe McCarthy as an attorney who became a judge. He, he's just a, a delightful guy. And then next then was uh, Paul Bolger. Paul uh, was a union official for the Carpenters Union of Fox Valley, mm -hmm. and he was just uh, just a great guy. And then the, then Frida Simon, Frida was uh, Dr. Simon's uh, wife, 
and they, she, she, she knew everybody. And, and actually, she's the one that worked and was probably most successful in getting us elected. And she has a doctor's degree from University of Chicago. I never did fully understand what it meant, but I was impressed by it. And so, so we, we all got elected. There's was, such a variety of skill sets yeah. there. They they took they, they did did things that were were good. Yeah. So uh, yeah, that was good memories. Good memories. So. In thinking about the founding board and all the things that you had to do at the very beginning of this separation of Elgin Community College from the school district. Um, well, we were fortunate that uh, Gil Renner was president of the, of the college when it was under the, the U46. And uh, he was, in fact, he started in, I think, late 40s. Um, and he, he was just a delightful person and easy to work with and, and so it was, it was fun to work with him and he could see what's going on. Uh, we did a lot of things. To, we knew we're, eventually we'd be able to have a campus somewhere when the state approved it and, and that didn't happen until, well, it, 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 was, it was just getting, they were slow getting it started and funding. <laughs> It's a, it's a problem that's still existing. Because you Illinois. had to go through various classes, uh, class two, and to get to class one, where there was actually would be funding from the state. No, the, the, the state had a big budget for uh, 20, 28 or nine colleges in Illinois, and they all wanted money. They all wanted to build, so it was uh, a very very active time. Uh, but anyway, getting back a little bit, uh, we, we did a lot of things. Uh, Channing Y, uh, which was relatively new then, we talked them into excavating their basement and putting four or five classrooms in the basement of the Channing Y. Uh, we put a library in the basement of the uh, temple. The, Masonic Temple. Masonic Temple. And uh, we did other things. I think the cutest one we did, we had just starting uh, a nursing program and we had no place to do it. So we rented, or at least for a while, a, a little church that was right next to the high school. Do you know where I'm talking about? Yes. And. Uh, the lady who was in charge of it, she's uh, Margaret, Margaret, I can't think of her last name. Gabler. Gabler, there you go. She uh, was so thrilled, she said, come on, I want to show you what we've got. Well, you know, it wasn't much bigger than this room. <laughs> Had one or two beds and a, and a fake person in it. She, that, that was just unbelievable, delightful for her. She's so excited, and as time went on, she was constantly let us know that her students would take the exam and they would do better than the four-year students from Northern Illinois. And I understand that still exists today, that these the kids, but wow, the difference in the facilities is amazing. So, but that was, that was all, that was interesting. But then we, we, we said, well, we, we've got to find a, a place where we could build a, a new campus. And so we started looking, but we didn't have to look very long, and it, it was uh, evident that there was going to be about 250 acres available from the mental health that they don't need it anymore. They, they used to use it for their 5,000 inmates, which now it's 150, uh, but they had to have something to do, so that they worked the farms and stuff. Well, anyway, they didn't need to pay more. Well, Elgin decided they wanted, city of Elgin. Well, we said, we really need this, and what are you going to do with it? We want to build a golf course. 
And I said, well, you don't need all this, do you? And so we, we said, well, we need about 95 or 100 acres. And uh, I said, we need it right here where, where it is today. And, and, uh, and they, you can have all the rest. And they got a, we got this and they got a 160 or 80, I forget. And I said, well, that's, that's really a good deal for us because we have, we have this great location and we have this golf course to give us beautiful landscaping all around. Doesn't cost us anything, and that way, that way, it's the way it was. It was very good, and uh, well, then that, that's when we get started. But so then you had to select an architectural firm. Well, the first thing we did was was we went out and sold bonds, five million dollars worth of bonds, and we went down to Chicago. All of us, when well, they opened up the bids on. And we got up for two and a quarter percent. So never had they given bonds that low before. So we were just thrilled. So we immediately took the five million and invested it in a very safe uh, bond of some sort. I don't remember anymore. But uh, we were making money then off of our five million. In fact, we before we had to use up the five million, we had. 400,000 extra money, which we'll tell about later. But uh, so now we had to decide, well, we, we, were, we had been going on a lot of trips and we'd seen a lot of good, ones, good schools and some not so good. The one we liked the best was Lorraine, Ohio. And the reason for it was they had separate buildings, but they were all connected. They were connected with first class tunnels that were nice, and they were right along the, the uh, lake where it gets so cold and everything. So you could go from all that and never leave, and you, so you could put your coats away or, and go anywhere. And so that was one thing we said, we got to have the same. We got to have it so the buildings are connected. And uh, so then we decided to, we interviewed, uh, um, architects, and it was very evident real quick that the best fit for us was Perkins and Will. Perkins and Will was uh, a, a Chicago firm, still is today, one of the finest, still in the country, very, very big, and uh, they were to be the lead ones. But then their second, we, they didn't want to do all the work, they just wanted to do the creative part, and, uh, and then some of the other, and, and they, all the real hard work they wanted to let out to a local firm, and it was a firm in Geneva, can't remember it anymore, uh, but they were very good, and they, they together they started. And uh, they put uh, a, a man named Will Kwong. Young guy, dynamo, and he, there's three or four things that are real interesting about Will. We, we, uh, we told him first we wanted to have, have it so the buildings would be connected. We don't want to have to go outside and coats off, coats on, and all that stuff. He said, well, we'll take care of that. And then he showed us a preliminary design that all of this, the building that he's designing would be on 22 foot squares, columns every 22 feet. And we looked at it, well, yeah, but you've got 22 foot wide hallways. That's such a waste. We could have a lot of other classes. And he says, well, you got to trust me here. He says, uh, we'll go down to Wabansi, well, which just finished their first one. And we'll go there during a class change. And we went, we stood in the hall. <laughs> it, it was like you were driving to, to O'Hare and, and everybody was uh, shuffling each other around. It, it was a disaster. We, we never again questioned him um, on that width of the, and today or yesterday when I was here, 
I walked down those halls and they're still there and they're still performing exactly the way he wanted them to. And then, two more things with Will. Uh, when they got ready to open the, the, the building, uh, he he told them what kind of signs he wanted them and, and to identify them and everything. And they said, okay, we'll put them up. And, Whoa! He says, no, you won't. I will put them up. I will put every one of those up. I want them to be in the right place so they'll look right. Okay, so he did. And we thought, well, that's nice. And then we had this 400000 The state would not come through with enough money that we could build what we had designed at Perkinsville, which was a swimming pool and two to, uh, at that time you would have a men's and a women's a gymnasium and a wrestling room. We had all that designed and we just couldn't, couldn't build it. Well here we had this beautiful building going up and there's not even a gymnasium out here. for You just can't not, not have a gymnasium for a college. So we could look at this 400000 that we had saved up and uh, we all agreed that we did get a local contractor. We had three good ones uh, that were good. And we talked to them and see what kind of place they would put. Will Quam heard about that, and he, I thought he was going to blow his top. He says, don't you dare do that. You're going to put up a tin box of a, of a gymnasium and ruin my whole design I have here? And I said, well, Will. We can't afford to. We only got four hundred grand, and it'll take that to do it. We can't afford to pay you. Yes, you can. I will do the whole thing for you for five thousand dollars, and I'll guarantee you can get it built for for four hundred. And he designed that. And if you remember, it it was you hardly knew what it was, people, because it was buried in the ground, and they had the berms up, and they. Each corner had that architectural entrance. It was, it was really nice. Parts of it are still there. But uh, that, was, that was Will. And, uh, so that the first part of the campus was built, you had what they called A building. Mm -hmm. and, and so that housed what? Well, <laughs> everything. Everything. <laughs> well, yeah. The, and the, the, what do they call the B building? Uh, got, where, where the uh, administrative office was. Right. Well, it was only part way. Later on, we added there. And then the other wing on the far side, which was uh, auditoriums for uh, chemistry and right. biology. Right, all the and biology all and the math. We also pushed out that way and expanded. Well, since then, <laughs> shoved it out another notch or two. But uh, yes, uh, it was everything. I mean, areas where, I mean, Everything was there. We had room. And With very little exception, that whole concept of the connectivity of the campus is still in place. We still we yeah. do have some buildings that are. It's online. only because those buildings were in the industrial uh, area, but even some of them were, like the first one we built was or not built. We bought, rented first was the nursing and. Uh, plastics and nursing and something else we had in, in there and then eventually North Annex is that what you're talking about well, I, I forget yes. what we call right. it and uh, but but that but that one is now connected because you can go across the road and, and then go all the way there's just that another the other one that's that was purchased long since I was around that's across the street from where right that, and then the two that they redid so beautifully, can't get they're to those. Gorgeous. But oh, they're nice. Yeah. Yes. So you served on the board from 1966 to 1978. Yep. And so you were uh, you worked with three different presidents. I sure did. Mr. Renner, yeah. Dr. Apple, and Dr. Hopkins. Yes, they were all just perfect for the times that were there. Bill was just, uh, you, you knew him, I think, didn't you? I met him, yeah. yes. And Jack, did you know him? Yep. Yeah. Uh, it's just a great guy, and uh, 
I was so sad when he said he wanted to retire, but he was he was ready to quit. But he was the perfect person to have start. Then we had Bob Apple that was hired and was here for four years, and he was at the right time too because there were there were no regulations or rules or anything, and he put together everything and so that his successor would have something that was written down and was, was the law. And uh, so he, was, he, he did, did well. Uh, he, he left, uh, well, he had, he had a little few problems, but most of them do. Mm -hmm. and, uh, but uh, I, I got to see him and, and talk to him uh, for a long time, just two, well, two or three years ago before, before he died. He was a very nice person. And then uh, Mark Hopkins was uh, the exact opposite of those others. He's a, he's a dynamo. He was, you all know him so well. Uh, but but he, uh, he got a lot of people that really liked him. He got a lot of people that didn't like him because he was, he was very, very forceful. And, and, uh, but, but I think he was here at the right time, but he had a, he had a very difficult time the last couple of years. But it's interesting that uh, he left here after six years, I believe, and uh, that was after I was gone, and uh, went to South Carolina where he took over a private two-year school, and converted it to a four-year school. And then he started three other universities, one in India, one in California, and I forget where the third one was. And then he has a, has a business that now his daughter is running, where he finds qualified foreign students. So there's some schools that are always looking to diversify their enrollment, and they can't get them sometimes. And, he gets them for them. That's been a good business for him. And he has now gone into, well, he's, he writes a weekly newspaper article that's published in 200 newspapers. Uh, he also is on his second novel, which is, uh, which is both of them are about the Civil War. Uh, so anyway, yeah, he left and, uh, uh, well, he, he, did, he did fine here and, and uh, he was very successful when he right. left. Right, right. Thank you. Um, there came a time when the college needed to uh, start a foundation, a foundation mm -hmm. to solicit external funding. And I know you've been involved in it. Can you describe your involvement? Yes, I was probably on it right away because I was on the board when it started. Well, anyway, I was not as optimistic as I should have been probably because my theory was that it's difficult to ask for money for an organization that's supposed to be supported by the state of Illinois and by your real estate taxes. He said, well, I'm, my, my, my Illinois taxes are supposed to pay for this, and my real estate tax, now you want me to pay more? I said, that, that's a tough sale. And it was, it was, and still is. And, uh, well, I'll say that uh, the staff that's here now is unbelievable. She is so good, and she is, I just saw in my communication that they're in their first month of the year and they brought in $400,000 already in the first month. When it started, 400000 was beyond belief for five years. Right. And so, so it's, a, it's an organization that has done some great things because, of course, a lot of it is scholarships. But they are, there's always things in a school like this that uh, 
funds weren't available for. And you just say, well, they, do you really need this? Well, yeah, we need it, but well, we, do, we don't we want to use the tax money and, and so on. Uh, but you, you've got to have that available to, to make a, a school just even, even better. I just walked down the hallway down here, which is, oh, it must be 300 feet long, wide hallway, big thing. I'm just looking, wow, I think this, this whole hallway ought to have some art in it of some sort, either mirrors on the wall or something. I mean, those kind of things you can do with extra money. Right. Uh, but there are, there are many others that are really more important. Sometimes they get a expensive program started that they didn't think they could afford the equipment. And so it's been very good, very successful, and I still am a, an emeritus uh, on that board. I don't go anymore. Can you tell us a little bit about the naming of the Blizzard Theater? Yeah. Well, of course, I, I gave considerable money at one time, and because uh, I felt that well, I, I love the place, and I ought to, that's where my spare money ought to go, and so I gave it. And, and, I, and, and then later on, when Michael Shirley was president of the, he decided, we, we've got to name this thing. And uh, so he came out and said, we want to name the, the auditorium after you. And Phyllis said, oh no. I said, that's just craziness, because it, that would, that ought to be a named after Dean Chipman, and because uh, and, Dean Chipman did so much, and uh, I mean, it's, you could talk a whole day on what he's done in this community, and they and they said no, we've named the street out there that goes to it after him. And I said, well, well, I and then Phyllis says no, she didn't think she ought to do that. Well, this went on for two years, and I think they—they they must have talked to her <laughs> five, six times. I think they finally wore her out. But we've been there. We go there you know, every month or two, and uh, we never go in there that that she doesn't say, "Well, this shouldn't be named this. It should be named Chipman." And I said, well, Phyllis, that's the way it goes. <laughs> but um, uh, I think now she's got some pride when our children come back and see that. They're, they're rather proud of that. And uh, I'm proud of them. So uh, it's, it's a tough thing. Um, I have friends that are anonymous givers of great amounts of money, and they They'll never give again if you tell them who is giving it. And uh, there's advantages that way, too. But, uh, well, so anyway, that's what it is. Before we take a break, and I'd like to take a little break, um, is there anything else about the college, um, about any of the, or, or the foundation that you would like to share? Any anecdotes, any stories? Well, the foundation, uh, the, I can't remember the guy's name now. He was uh, a professor at the University of Illinois and he used to commute up here to, for the, when he was uh, president of the foundation. He was very, I mean, he was dynamo to get this thing started. Is that Chaz Wolf? Yes, Chaz Wolf. That's right. I couldn't remember. And then my next door neighbor and very, very close friend. Uh, was uh, Rolestad, and uh, he he then became ch chairman of it and ran it for quite some time. Wendy was uh, he was he was a very good man until he got uh, a terrible disease that you get uh, Parkinson's, I guess it is. But anyway, that that was very good. Uh, as far as the college is concerned, itself, uh, <laughs> I don't see how you guys could want anything better than you've got. It's just magnificent. Uh, and I think, uh, from what I can tell, uh, 
Dr. Sam is uh, doing well and is well liked, I guess. And whatever, it, it's, it's amazing how, how they keep getting awards for this, that, and the other. And, uh, it's uh, it's been a great great thing, and and uh, I don't think any of us in '65 could uh, could visualize how these schools are going to be, and to to be in this. You know, this I just never thought this campus would be with the square footage that's here. It's just amazing. Can we now focus your attention on your love of symphonic music? Can you talk to us about how that? Uh, how that started? You bet. <laughs> well, first of all, I have no musical talent at all. I mean, I'm the most non-musical person that ever lived. I couldn't carry a tune, I can't sing, I can't do a thing. Uh, I, I tell my wife, I said, why, why, why did, did God make me so, so blasted handsome and, and with no talent? And she, I just set her up. She said, well, you missed out on both. <laughs> <laughs> so, so that's the way it goes. But I came from a little town in that part of Iowa. They're probably one of the symphony orchestra within 150 miles. I mean, Des Moines and Sioux City, maybe, back in the 40s. And uh, I didn't know what that was. So here I am in Fort Snelling, Minnesota, halfway between Minneapolis and St. Paul, and there's a sign up that says uh, free tickets to the Minneapolis Symphony Orchestra. And I talked to one of my friends, I says, hey, you want to go? He said, sure. So we get out in that train and went, went in and, and uh, I get in and they, they, they give you the tickets here. I tend to be in uniform and, and I get the tickets. I said, oh, look, we got the best tickets in the house. Uh, why is that? Well, it's on, on the first row. Well, I, I didn't know the first row was the worst ticket in the house. <laughs> okay. So, but it was the best ticket in the house. Uh, we sat right here, and stage was up here, and about 20 feet off over that way was the podium. Okay. So we're ready, and the orchestra is coming, and then they quietly out comes this guy that, woo, he comes trotting out, he's bald as a billiard ball, and he gets there and jumps up on that podium and looks around at his orchestra and lifts his baton, and he starts. And wow, I just was getting the start of that. He was the most expressive, conductor that I've ever seen since. He, he was unbelievable. His name was Dimitri Metropolis. He went from Minnesota Orchestra later to the New York Philharmonic where he uh, stayed for a while and then, then he did, decided to quit or something. But anyway, it, it just absolutely uh, fascinated me that that he, he, I always thought, well, they're up there thinking, do, do, do any of those players pay any attention to him? You betcha they pay attention to him. And he, if, you, if he doesn't have you, you will know it. <laughs> and and so, so I learned quickly. Well, luckily, Minneapolis Symphony was, was, had to travel. That's part of their, that's why they get money from I don't know, wherever they get it. And uh, so they traveled to Iowa State when I was a freshman. And we had, a, uh, oh gosh, we had it at, at what's, what was called a state gym. I mean, it was a terrible place to have an orchestra. Acoustics were just lousy. But I said, well, okay. Well, I was so shocked, because this is now two years later, because I was off a year. Uh, here comes Demetri Metropolis again. And they were back for four, all four years, and all four years I heard him and saw him conduct. And so that was, that was the start, that's how it got started. Mm -hmm. uh, 
and I, I still feel today that uh, the young people have their sound, and, and rightly so, but uh, when a 75-piece orchestra is going out full blast, they can make you <laughs> enough moments to pick you right up. And uh, we have that in our conductor today at the symphony. He is absolutely amazing. And he, he, he wears himself out at the podium. But anyway, Jack, you go, you know what he is. Uh, but, well, anyway, that's how, that's how it started. So you came to Elgin, and um, what, was, what was happening in symphonic well, music? Then? Not much. <laughs> I mean, uh, the symphony was first called something else, I forget now. I think it was the Civic uh, Orchestra. The Civic Orchestra, yes, I guess that was it. And they, they were all amateur, but they were okay. I, I wouldn't know that much difference, but uh, those who uh, know or knew it was not so, so, so good. Uh, I went the first time with, to the symphony in the new, then, uh, Larkin High School Auditorium, which now is, they have a new auditorium to replace that new one. I went and there weren't over 150 of us there. And I said, this is not, this is not good. Something's wrong. What's going on here? And, uh, well, things started happening. Uh, Doug Steensland uh, started it, and he, and he was a perfect person. He was a member of the U46 music department, and he was the perfect person to get it started. And, uh, and he did a good, great job. Uh, and then, then things started to happen. Uh, Dean Chipman was, well, I think he was in charge of the symphony at that time. Uh, he and, well, I think at that time, I think Bob Hanson was just here, and he was just very young then. And uh, they decided they had to do something. And uh, so th they took a chance and contacted Margaret Hillis, who was a world-known conductor of vocal choruses, of Chicago Symphony one in particular. And uh, she came out and and uh, I, I looked it up because I, I wasn't remembering. But the first time she came out was in Feb February of 67. Hmm. And uh, of course the Hammonds was not open yet. Uh, and then later she, just, she said she would come out and, and uh, be the uh, music director. And I know she came out uh, in 1971 and stayed till 1985. It was almost 14 years. And uh, during that time, she accomplished exactly what she said needed to be done. She said, uh, you, you must have the amateur players because there's a place for them. But if you're going to have a first class orchestra, you've got to have professional players, people that are making their living because they're they're good enough. And so we started doing that. Well, prior to that, there was just a group of us, uh, mostly Ash Arnold, uh, president of the Union Bank, and uh, Ed Brody, he, we three and another guy would sit down in, in uh, Ash's office and say, well, how much do we have to raise for the symphony this year? And we'd say, well, maybe 25000 this year. Well, let's go out and get it. And we'd do it, and that was the end of it. Uh, well, it's not exactly like that anymore. But we had, to, we had to take a step up, and so we knew that we were going to have to really start bringing in more money. 
and we, but we first should get more people to come. And of course that was helped immensely when the heavens was open. But in her 14 years, uh, the, the orchestra was entirely professional when she left. And uh, Bob was uh, worked under her for three or four years as first assistant music director and then associate. They worked together. Mm -hmm. and, uh, and he took off and then he did so much to to continue the growth of it. Not only the growth of, of the symphony, but he also was involved in what was then called the Elgin Choral Union. And then uh, I also established what I think now is the most remarkable organization in the country, and that's the Elgin Youth Symphony. Uh, I just can't believe that he's got 300 and some youngsters that will commit at least 40 Sunday nights to come and practice. And that's happened. And so uh, a lot of things happened uh, with the symphony and that was the good ones. And the, the symphony under Doug Steensland started under the auspices of the college. Yeah. And so you saw it um, actually flourish at the beginning with the college and then split off from the college. Well, Doug Steenland was, was employed by the U-46. Uh, when he started, there was no connection to the college, I don't think, okay. when he started it. But then later on, yes, there was a connection, yeah. It, uh, we were fortunate to have a guy like him to get it started. And then right. we reeled right along. And, we're just on our, he's first, second, third. We're on our only our fourth uh, music director in, what are we, 65 years now, I guess. Right. It's amazing. And so, um, what are your perspectives on um, our current conductor, our current maestro? Well, <laughs> uh, well let's tell the story. I, when Bob uh, decided to to resign uh, very suddenly, and it left us in a terrible position, and uh, when I never have understood why he did it, and probably never will, but uh, it happened. We had all the advertising out with for the next season already printed, and all with his name on it. So we had to junk it all and start from scratch. And so our first thing was, well, we have to. Yeah, you know, we're going to get a, a new person. So uh, I got to be chairman of that board, and we worked for two years. And uh, first of all, we put the word out, and 240 people applied, some of them from overseas even. And uh, I asked the, the guy who, we, the, who uh, is a professional at these things, four symphonies, why do we get so many? And he says, well, there's three reasons. One, there are far more conductors than there are orchestras. <laughs> he said, number two, uh, you, you have a reputation that's, that's national. They know about that Elgin is a superior uh, orchestra. What's three? He says, because you're within 25, 30 miles of Chicago. I said, why is that so important? Because you have this unbelievable pool of professional musicians that you can get as substitutes, and your, your, your orchestra will stay the same quality. So uh, with that, we went and uh, we didn't want to we weren't qualified to narrow it down, and so this company, which uh, uh, was
Dallas belonged to the uh, former uh, executive director of the Chicago Symphony. His, mind, his name slips me right now. Uh, he had this company and he says, they will narrow us down to about 30. So they cut out 210 of them. And uh, I said, well, that makes So we took the 30 and uh, each one of us took six and we listened to their, what they were doing and, and visually and uh, so on. And we were able to then narrow that down to 12. And with 12, we said, every one of those 12 must come and conduct. And that took a long time, it took two years. This was difficult because we were sort of, uh, you know, we were without the boss and, uh, and uh, you need a guy to run the show. And so we started hearing him and yes, we, we liked several of them and they were good. And everybody's getting a little antsy here after a year and a half, and we only had two to go. And I think it was me that I said, well, what, a, what about we just chop it off now and select one and, and go? Well, she said, that they wouldn't like that. They would think that's not appropriate. I said, yeah, but the, <laughs> we're hurting. We need to have somebody running. And we decided, well, we would qualify that. One person that we were pretty positive, that's all right, he could come, but we didn't think that he was probably going to be very close to, well, from what we've heard. Mm -hmm. uh, so now we didn't know about this 12th guy. And we knew he'd, he conducted all over the world, but he never had an orchestra before. Okay, well, can, first let's find out, is he really serious? If he is, if he isn't, if he's just playing games, uh, tell him to get lost and then we'll pick it from what we had, two or three that would have been fine. And uh, they call his agent and his agent says, no, he is very serious. And it's because I'm telling him that he has to quit being an itinerant conductor and he needs to have his own orchestra if he's going to go up the ladder. And uh, I said, so he really would like this? Absolutely. I said, now the big question, he's making a lot of money. We can't afford to pay him at that rate. He says, don't you worry, I'm his manager, and if he likes this place, I will see that he will take it out of something you can afford. So with that, we waited. We didn't know for sure what we were gonna get. And he comes and conducts. And we had four of our members out of the 12 were members of the orchestra. So the first thing after we huddle, after we interview him and then huddle is, well, what do you think? He's the one. All four of us, unanimous, he's the one. So I said, well, why don't you ask the rest of your players that we he conducted what they think too. And we huddled and we all agreed that he, he, he was, was it. And their, their whole orchestra replied back. It, would, uh, it was unanimous that every one of them thought he was the one. And, he, and the, the guys who had a lot of experience and this kind of thing, they said, that's never happened, that an orchestra could be unanimous on that. So with that, we got him with a three-year contract. And then last year, we extended it for another five years. So we have him for eight. And I, I kid him, I said, I think we ought to start him now for, for another four years on the top of that. Uh, but he's very happy to be here, and the orchestra loves him. I ask members of the orchestra, okay, he's been here almost three years now, and you've uh, been conducted many times by him. You still like him? Oh, yeah. He's even better than we, we every, every time. Uh, why is he better? Well, he, one of them said, 
there's some, this particular piece, I never really liked it. And uh, then, then he's conducting it. Now I love it. He's getting things out of the music that most people never got before. So uh, we are very fortunate to have this. And on top of that, he's a nice kid. He's a kid to me, I think it was, well, he's in his 30s, 35 or 6, I think now. That's a, that's a child to me. But uh, he, he's very good with people, and he agrees that he has to spend time going out and meeting people who could be donors. We never have to have him ask for anything. He just goes along and gets to know them. And, and they, 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 well, we, we would never ask anybody for major donations unless they've seen him conduct. That makes a big difference. You understand that, Jack, over there? And we're talking about Andrew Graham. <laughs> you betcha. Yes. Um, and last, uh, the symphony has uh, had a continuing relationship with the city of Elgin. Do you have, from the perspective of um, yeah. past president of the board, board well, member? We had a very strong relationship with ECC, too. But that dwindled a little because I think the board later on decided they shouldn't have such a strong. They paid. They allowed Bob Hansen two-thirds of his time with, applied to the symphony. We didn't pay Bob anything at all. So that was good. And they, they did a lot of things, uh, graphic work, graphic artists, and, and other secretarial stuff. And, of course, gave us this corner office over here uh, until we decided, uh, I guess somebody decided, that we ought to maybe move downtown. And uh, the city was very good in giving us all the space we needed, and it's very nice in a perfect location downtown. And it, they don't charge us for anything. And so they did give us that. And they've always given us the, uh, the right to secure the, the best dates before anybody else. There's just a couple things in the spring that have to be done for some of these dance groups that they have to have the same time in the Hammonds. But generally they've been very good with that. Then for 10 years or more, they gave us $150,000 every year. Well, they quit doing that. <laughs> At the time, well, it was right after the 08 financial crash. And uh, we're, we're working strong to get them back to support us a little more again. But they, they're very good. They know, they know that the symphony is an asset for the community. You look at any of their brochures or, or information that's out, uh, why a company ought to locate in Elgin, they will, they will end it all with, we have the great symphony orchestra. That you, you don't have to go to Chicago to hear good music. It's right here. Mm -hmm. So those are the things. That's good. Another one of your involvements in the Elgin area is with the Elgin Area Historical Society. Can you tell us a little bit about that? Yeah. Uh, back in 76, our 200th anniversary, that they had a buck-a-brick program uh, to raise money, and we raised $100,000. And uh, the city, I don't know if they, yeah, they just taken over the old main from the academy. And they didn't know what to do with it. They were, they were thinking about tearing it down. And uh, they'd had, had a fire inside, which wasn't that terrible, but it wasn't, didn't help it any. Uh, but anyway, the 100,000. They put on a new roof, the new cupola, and fixed a lot of windows. And I think they had to build a stairway uh, because you require two stairways. You can't have a building that'll hold a hundred and some people with only one stairway. 
And then they, I think, I don't know if that also got us the elevator or not, I can't remember now. But uh, then the society didn't have any place for their stuff before. So the, we, we, we gathered up the money that took floor at a time. The first floor we got done, got it fixed and got the place open. And the second floor was done, and that's all exhibit area two, and uh, that was done. Then the third floor, which is important, but it's 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 the storage for. You know, all all museums probably have ten times as much stored as they have shown. So we got all that stuff up there, and then all the offices and everything else are, are up there, and so that went floor at a time, and it took. 10 or 12 years to get to the point where the whole building was open. Well, we have a very good uh, curator, in, uh, Liz Marston, and uh, she has just done a wonderful job. And we've got, that, we've got some people that just work so hard, and, uh, and it's, just, it's a pleasure to, to be part of it. And so, it, it, and if, if you people haven't seen it, you ought to go. It, it's amazing. It's interesting. We, we get we get people from out of Elgin to come, and they say, "Wow, this is even interesting." I didn't even know anything about this Elgin Watch Company. That that's the biggest exhibit we have, and uh, they said we didn't know it was that huge and that big. And, so you know, it's it's interesting place. You know. And then you've also been involved in the cobblestone houses on West Chicago Street. Well, uh, yeah, well we're, that's just something real new. Uh, there are only six cobblestone houses in the city of Elgin. There were two more, one just outside, and then uh, and they tore them down. And there's one in South Elgin, uh, as you can see very easy, and when you go down to South Elgin. This side, but anyway, uh, it's a uh, it's a shame that the one up there has been boarded up and and it's been trashed a little bit and and so our guys uh, the, I don't do any of this anymore, but it's Bill Briska and George Rowe uh, decided that we ought to take that over and make that the next project. So they have gotten uh, 100 to $150,000. It's going to cost uh, half a million to get it fixed up and s secure. The foundation has to be checked. But it, it's a beautiful little building and it, you just got to save those things. And they will use it for public use when they get, get ready. I, I was going to tell you a little story though, this little back at, uh, when when, before we got involved in the symphony, Phyllis and I were involved with an organization called the Fox Valley Music Association. And we brought in top stuff. We brought in the Chicago Symphony twice to play. And that was after the Hammonds was open. And uh, we also had a lot of, uh, of good people, which some of them I can't remember. One in particular I do remember was uh, Ben Clive, Van Clyburn. Yeah, Van Clyburn. Well, we had him, and it sold out, 1,200 seats, just like that. So we asked the fire chief, could we put 200 seats on the stage and and uh, fill those two? And he said yes, as long as uh, this, that, and the other. And we had to ask Clyburn's agent, can can we uh, have those people clap close to? Oh yeah, that's fine. So Dean Chipman was in charge of this at the time. And it was two o'clock Sunday, quarter to two. Well, Mr. Clymer wasn't there yet. We got fourteen hundred people in that, in that building. Ten minutes to not there. Two o'clock, not there. Now, here's where you want to have a cell phone. Where in the hell are you? But they didn't have them back in those days. 
10 minutes after, not there. Panic time, 20 minutes after, all of a sudden, this limousine comes around, screeching around the corner, pulls up, and this big tall, he's very tall, it was, he just died, um, jumps out, he's all half dressed, he's dressing himself and putting on his tails, and he runs up, he says, I don't know what he told me, but they, they got lost, I think, I don't know what it was. But there he comes out, that's 20 minutes after starting time. He says, don't worry, I am ready to go. And he, he then gets, you know, and then calmly, slowly walks, uh, like he's out right on time. And he plays, and of course, he's, he's, he's a, he was a great pianist. And, but that was, that's the kind of stuff that <laughs> happens. And, you know, well, I don't know what we'd have done. You take it up and announce to 1400 that we'll pay your, your money back. And they went, well, I don't want my money back. I want to hear him. <laughs> what do you do? Huh? But let's see, got, there's some more things here that you wanted to talk about, wasn't there? Well, I wanted to thank you for sharing that story about yeah. Ben Kleiber. Um You're also involved in uh, the YMCA. Yeah. It, YMCA, it's so sad that the uh, Y out on, what's the name of it? Uh, the street, I can't think of the street. McLean? Uh, no, 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 the one on the east side, when we tore the thing down. Oh. Uh, come on, Jack. Well, anyway, they tore it down. Channing? That's, that's it? such a shame because it was a good building. It was Channing. 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 Channing, yeah. Uh, so they, they've suffered a little, and of course they've expanded uh, the one uh, out on, on uh, McLean Boulevard, Taylor Y. And uh, I've been involved in that and trying to get it done. But I tell you, the greatest thing about the Y is it's, it's one of its sidelines, and that's Camp Edwards. Camp Edwards is up in, uh, 30 miles across the border into Wisconsin on Lake Beulah. It is the nicest place you ever saw. Our kids all spent time there, uh, staying overnight or over the week, and you could do it for a whole week. And it, it's just it's a delightful place. It's, uh, you feel like you're way up in the North Woods. And uh, there are two nice homes, one's called the Hoffer Home, and the other is called, uh, not some other name. And, uh, and it's just fine. Well, they're combined now with, with the YMCA of Schaumburg. So we've got a lot more people involved. And, uh, Camp Edwards is just sold out. They, they, they get, they can only take so many uh, in a season, and there's 50 or 60 or so every year that don't get it, don't get to go. Mm -hmm. So they're planning a major expansion up there, and it's about a four million dollar project, and uh, I'm going to, I'm going to get as involved as I can with that, okay. because it is, it is just so great. And uh, they have such a great time. And uh, the guy in charge here is very gung-ho. They have a man who actually runs it up there. He lives down the other place. And he's been there about five, six years, and he's good. So we're looking forward to it. You'll, you'll be hearing about They'll be looking for some money. But uh, four million they have to do is uh, not easy. But uh, yeah. What about your church? Well. <laughs> church uh, is, is very important to our family. First of all, Phyllis is a PK. PK, that's a preacher's kid. Her father was a Methodist minister. So you you are with United Methodist well, Church? Well, I didn't have much choice there, uh, which is fine with me. Uh, but, uh, and also when we first went uh, to the Church. It was a time when Dr. Rogers was uh, the minister there. 
you know, the people that I've been around may not know that. Rogers is, uh, well, <laughs> he's, a, he's a dynamo. And uh, so you'd sign on a little sheet the first time we went there that we were maybe interested. Bingo, he was out the next night and spent two hours with us to make sure we were coming. So we've been there all the time. And Phyllis, gets, she's involved with her quilting and involved with the mistletoe mark, which they had for so many years, and other activities. And uh, I've been on the board until they kicked me off, and then they put me on another one. And, and so, uh, it, but I'll tell you why. Uh, that, and I'm going to bring up the word rotary. I didn't know anybody in Elgin because my business was all to, so I needed to get to know people. We both did. And we could do it easiest from church. That church had 2,200 members at one time. Now it has 200. But it's, that's the way things go. But they're all acquaintances, friends, and so on. And Rotary, that was so good for me because there were 150, no, 120 in Rotary at its maximum. And there were always 60 or 80 at the dinner every Monday. I'd take time to go there and get to know them. So now I, now I know lots of people locally that I had no way of knowing just simply by the church and Rotary. So I think those, those are interesting. Probably the minister wouldn't like me to hear say that's the reason we come to the church. But, uh, well, but we all have our own reasons. <laughs> <laughs> uh, but, and what about PADS? What does PADS stand for and how uh, are you involved in that? Uh, what is it? People, or, I forget. <laughs> but uh, PADS, uh, as, you, as you know, it takes care of the homeless. Right. And uh, it was running very good at Salvation Army. Salvation Army's location is good. They had a large gymnasium. They had restrooms that would work with them. They also had a kitchen they could feed them. Everything went good. I thought, well, that's taken care of it. All of a sudden, Salvation Army says they don't want them anymore. So now we've got a problem. So immediately there were six churches, of which ours was one, that agreed to take them for one month. This was difficult. That's every night. You had so every night for a, for for a, a month. month. It was uh, November, December, January, February, March, and April, I think. And that worked for a while, but most of the churches didn't like it because it was, it's difficult. We were. They're not designed for that. Mm -hmm. So we worked hard to find out where they could put a pads. Well, that, that old NIMBY, not in my backyard, <laughs> hits you all over the place. So it was hard to find a place, but finally we found one out in the industrial area, just nearby here. And we, it's very, very nicely done. Uh, Jack Shales did the work. and. We are, we got the money and fixed it up, and and it, it and the management there is just super. But but they, they, there's one problem. They'll take anybody as long as they are not drinking alcohol or they're not on drugs. And they come to the door. They can tell. They make their certain things. They know. They are either those. They can't come in. Well, that's the major problem with the homeless, those two things. Mm -hmm. Plus, the third thing is they, so many of them have mental problems. And uh, they, they can be violent even if they're off their meds and so on. So uh, we, we built that and it works fine. But now, this year, or last year or two, uh, they're worried about all these homeless when it gets 20 degrees and colder. So last year we took them and uh, it wasn't working. 
we said we didn't want to do it at our church, but we did it again because we got a different group, of, you know, a man and a woman, who are supervising it, and that's working. It's been seven times now this year mm -hmm. that we've had 20 to 30 people come in our, our basement at the First Methodist Church. No other church is doing that. And that's where I feel that uh, that's not the way it ought to be. <laughs> we ought to share it a little. And, but uh, anyway, uh, they, we'll, well, we won't let anybody come in that's, that's going to cause problems. That's, we have had no problems. But they do wander and they do, they're not. Uh, well, they're not the best uh, type of people sometimes, but uh, they are, and they are appreciative. They really like it. Uh, so, but the bads, I think, we, I, I feel that this, the city of Elgin and the Salvation Army basically have let the community down. I just can't believe the city couldn't find some space that they could have police supervise when it got that cold and take care of these people. Or why did the Salvation Army give it up? What? what, what, what they, from seven or eight in the night to seven or so in the morning, what are they doing with the gymnasium? I don't know. But anyway, that's a problem. And, uh, well, you, you know that we cut from 5,000 patients at the mental hospital to now down to about a hundred, maybe not even that many. There are still three or four hundred that are, are uh, criminally insane, but that's like a prison. Right. Yeah. So to sort of wrap this up, I'd like you to think about um, this young man who came to Elgin in the fall of 1956 with this trailer <laughs> and your view um, of what your life might be from 1956 and now reflecting yeah. that many years later what it has actually turned out to be. Well, I don't think I have any regrets whatever, but you know what can help that more than anything else is our family has been so fortunate with good health. We have not had anybody in our family, now that's my wife and I, our four children, four in-laws and seven grandchildren. I don't think anybody has been confined to their bed more than one or two days in all that time. Last time I was confined to to a place that was 1937 when I was 10 years old and got scarlet fever. Mm -hmm. I mean, our health has just been amazing. And if your health is good, uh, you're, you're well, well over half the way to, to enjoyable life. So that that's very important. And uh, I'm very pleased, I'm very proud of what Elgin has done, the things they've done, things they're going to do. I think in the next 10 years, they're going to see some big changes. Uh, lots of places are going to be built downtown. It's, it's just exciting. Yeah. Yes. Well, thank you, Mr. Blizzard. We appreciate You're it.